Our guest this week is the owner of a caregiving facility in New York and state of Washington. It is the Family Care Senior Services, LLC. What made him decide to be in this business? How does COVID affect the caregiving services? And what attitude do we need to thrive in this business? Our guest is Florante Coronel from Davao City, Philippines, and currently residing in New York, USA. Before we'll proceed to the main interview, I would like to remind our viewers to click on the subscribe button as well as the bell button so you get a notification every time a new video is being released. This is Jeanette Jordi at Global Inspiration, where you need to be seen, need to be heard, and be an inspiration to the world. Ladies and gentlemen, let's all welcome Florante Coronel. Welcome to the show, Florante. Thank you, Janet. I am thankful to the show and to the magnificent people behind it, to the host, of course, of Global Inspiration, Janet Jordi, and to all the viewers and followers of this program. Thanks. Thank you very much for that. You moved from the Philippines to USA. Why? I came to the United States in 2002, only a few months after 9-11. I was hesitant at first but uh, to come because I had a growing business in Cebu at that time. But I was trying to save a marriage. So I had to give it a priority. So I came. So tell us more about yourself, who you really are, Florante Coronel. Okay, okay. I, I was born in Mindanao and grew up there. I was born in Cotabato, part of North Cotabato now, Pigkawayan. And I grew up in Davao City where I got my elementary education, high school and college. I went to the University of Mindanao twice. And um, I, uh, I am a degree holder in business. And uh, most times of my professional life, I was in business, managing people, and and you know just just learning the, the, the learning the ropes in the trade, so to speak. Um, I was drawn to the healthcare industry because of an influence from a previous job. I worked for a pharmaceutical firm before Merck Inc. for almost nine years, and I got a glimpse of or a taste of what it is in the medical field and i was always intrigued with that so coming to the us i concentrated on that rather than going back to the corporate world so here i am i established my own company here related to healthcare and i've been doing this for almost two decades now okay that's good to know so when was the last time you have visited the philippines i never returned since 2002, okay. since I came here. Um, at first, I had this plan of going, you know, going back and forth. However, uh, personal life seemed to always intervene or interfere in such a way that I had to re always rethink my plans. Besides, I have four kids um, from my Filipino wife. And with the advent of you know, the video call nowadays, you have Viber, you have Messenger, you have Zoom, you have the FaceTime. So you can even speak to, well, relatives way back there, even grandkids, not only daily, but even in an, on an hourly basis. So things had really overtaken me or events had overtaken me so that resources were always diverted to something more a priority rather than my visit back home. Okay, so how long have you been in caregiving business and what exactly do you do? Okay, since I got here, I worked briefly with McDonald's, uh, you know, the restaurant of flipping burgers. But on weekends, I worked, um, I studied, trained, and uh, got the certificates to do caregiving. And the main reason was that I was looking for an occupation where I, I don't have to really deal with a lot of people. I guess, I guess I get the traumatic experience from dealing, um, you know, with 
with uh, positions in the corporate world before, uh -huh. and it always interfered with my personal life, how I would run it. So I chose one that is simpler to manage, like a, a, an occupation that is dealing only with either with one person or as fewer people as possible. So, and you know, add to it is that to most Filipinos, caregiving or helping someone uh, with supposing it's the elderly or even a childcare with their personal needs, it's almost second nature to us. So, you know, it's just, just like a fish, how a fish takes to water. I, I did not really have a difficult time transitioning into the, the healthcare industry. So, so what make you decide to be in the caregiving business? Is it because of your experience in the Philippines? What is it, Claude? Oh, at first, I was just looking for a job. And then I realized that I was more drawn into specific illnesses, uh, usually um, diseases that deals with or that character, well, they, they, they characterizes by by um, neurodegenerative diseases, you know, by, uh, misfunctioning of the brain. Uh, while I was in the medical field, I'm sorry, in the pharmaceutical field before, that was my main product lines, dealing with the central nervous system. So when I got here in Seattle in particular, so I noticed and I got in touch with people who had Parkinson's, cerebral palsy, um, ALS, you know, the low Gehrig's disease, uh, multiple sclerosis, and maybe the bigger of them all, the Parkinson's disease and the Alzheimer's dementia. When I focused on it at that time, they, they paid more money. So I stayed there and I created like a niche. So I was looking for clients through agencies or through my own efforts that deal, uh, for cases that deals mainly with those because there was a tendency for, for either the family or the clients themselves to, to pay more. So at first it just started that money was just the motivation. But then I realized that I had this little bit of inclination to, to expand what I left in the Philippines because I was already managing people, managing organization. So I established my own. And this was early on in my career, uh, way back in 2004. So I started helping people to place them in other people's homes, like cases, even in sort of assisted living facilities. So that's, that, that started me going. So I uh, <laughs> formalized that part and then I established my own company way back then. That is very interesting for us to know about this. And can you share with us the website and the contact information of your business? Absolutely. It's family caress, like family care ss.com so actually it stands for family care senior services so familycares.com and the main contact numbers are my mobile number because i'm i always pick up phone calls that's 9173999208 and the office phone here in new york which can also be well broadcasted to to seattle is 917 Seven four five one two three three. Okay, thank you very much. So, what is the process of you see your services? Let's say I have a friend in New York and they feel sick. What is the process? Do you, do they have to call you? Do go to the website? How does that work? Okay, things are a little bit different nowadays because of the pandemic last year. But but pretty much we're opening, you know, back to normal. So this is the short process. Uh, we get a lead. So I do the contact. I call family members or whoever is responsible for a new case, taking care of a loved one. So there will be a phone interview. And in that phone interview, I would, do, I would try to learn more about the case. This is what we call in-home care assessment. If necessary, I would be requesting for a in-person interview, if that's allowed by the family. If not, then we can just be creative and then just get the minutest detail because that's very important in the placement. Um, as a placement person, placement agency, I take pride in saying that 
my success rate in placing people is about 90% the first time. I don't want to go back to the drawing board and put another person again. You know, uh, uh, it's, it's just impractical. It's so costly. And it creates a lot of hassles, a lot of uh, anxiety. So after doing that, uh, the assessment, then I lined up the caregivers for interview. Again, go through the same process, either a phone interview or even a FaceTime interview. And if necessary, my worker will go there to be seen in person. And then we sign the formality, signing of agreements, which we can do a lot better now because we can just do uh, emailing it, attach it to the email and then they sign it, scan it, send it over. And then we start the service, as simple as that. Okay, that, that, that's good to know. So uh, COVID is upon us. Family members and our friends losing their jobs. We are working from home and schools, they do it virtually. How does COVID affected your business? Can you share with us? Yes, absolutely. Mostly in my particular case, um, how COVID affected my business is through the the downward efforts in marketing, because there's sort of a restriction or limitation, especially for smaller companies like myself, um, because we had to do a lot of in-person meeting, in-person uh, you know meeting and greeting, presentation, giving the brochures and all this and that, and of course clarifying all their questions. COVID remove all that, so the bigger companies, medium size to bigger. Uh, to large scale companies, they thrive on social media. They have the resources and they were, they were on that early on. The previous company that I managed for almost five years here in, in Long Island in New York, thrive on that. So that's how we grew by leaps and bounds. Unfortunately, when I started my own, it wasn't part of my plan. Partly because I, I, I was thinking of not really doing this as intensely as I would have, but because I was gearing myself towards retirement. So it was kind of like taking things easy. Then COVID, you know, COVID uh, stroke. So we were hit by COVID. Then I had to scramble and gather my resources. By then, the momentum was lost. So I didn't really lose a lot in terms of losing cases, but it did not, it did not grow for more than a year. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. It's a very wonderful and very good answer, interesting answer. So COVID doesn't affect us only health-wise. It also affects how we deal with our family and friends. So I am asking you, how has the pandemic taught you about yourself? Okay, um, as with other things or with so many things that bring fatal results, and are global in nature, meaning it affects a lot of people, affect a lot of places. It even transcends like boundaries to other countries. The pandemic emphasizes the need for extreme cooperation among people of different countries and persuasions and the paramount need for unity and understanding of each other. We are so diverse. Um, well, here in the United States, this is just one country, but still you could, you know, on, on almost everyday basis, you could feel, you could hear, you could observe all the differences in culture and in diversity. So it's very important that there's a lot of understanding of each other that would really help us a lot as, a, as human beings. So I consider you as thriving as successful in the um, caregiving field. What do you think is the right attitude one must have to be successful in this field? Okay, not only in business, but I would philosophize that it, this even includes um, carrying your personality, um, practicing your profession. This is very paramount. PMA, a positive mental attitude. And that speaks volume. Everything should be there, all positive. Of course, not COVID positive, but positive in, you know, in terms of characteristics, positive in outlook, positive in plans and programs. 
it, that's a very important thing, just being and remaining positive. Yeah, be PMA or positive mental attitude. I like that, PMA. So, okay. uh, what do you do to give yourself a break? Or what are your hobbies? Are you a member of any nonprofit organization? Tell us more about that. Okay, uh, currently, um, we're, well, I'm active with EHOS de Davao USA. This is a socioeconomic organization based here in New York and founded by our own, well, town mate, uh, Dr. Francis Mabel Acosta Rabilio. I'm the chosen vice president. We never had an election after that because of the pandemic. Um, where we, you know, we, we try to help people back there in our city, in Davao. That, that's why that's the essence of the title of the, the organization, EOC Davao. So uh, there's a lot of programs being lined up, not only in helping people being victims of calamities and natural disasters, but also there's a long-term program that we intend to implement in so far as helping needy families, you know, in, um, with, with education of their children, um, those like deserving, like brilliant kids, but they don't have the means. So we intend to go that way. That's the latest that I joined, but new here in New York, incidentally, I'm, I've been in New York less than 10 years. I've stayed long in the Northwest before that. Um, I was active in a faith-based organization, BCBP. That's Brotherhood of Christian Businessmen and Professionals. We started in the Philippines, in Manila, basically, and it's all over the Philippines. And now it's going international. I was active there prior to the pandemic. But then again, you know, the pandemic changed uh, almost everything. So the time that I have was focusing on my business and all these other endeavors. Well, there was, there was one that you asked about, uh, how do I give, spend my, my, my time uh, break? So this is mostly socializing because I am very close to a Filipino clergy who hailed from Kalinan, Davao City. And we were always, well, me and him, or him and myself, always invited to these various Philippine organizations, mostly from Mindanao. So where we do ministries with them, fellowshipping with them. So there's a lot of organizations here that I am active, but not really a member, but as honorary member, and almost always, almost on a weekly basis, we go out with them whenever there's a show. Just last night, we went to this mini concert here in, in Woodside and okay. uh, it's uh, co-sponsored by one of these organizations. So other than that, I am starting to learn ballroom, ballroom dancing, believe it or not, at my age. But yeah. that it's, it's kind of a simple exercise. Yeah, you, Aflo, you mentioned about faith and about clergy. Can you share with us about your life being a Christian? Yes, sure. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I, I wanted to, to talk about that lengthily, but for the, the constraints of time, I try to be brief. I, I hope yeah. I am successful. Okay, I grew up in a Catholic household. My father was not much of a practicing Catholic but my mother was a devout follower. In the latter part of my adolescent life, though, my mother had ceased to be a regular churchgoer. Uh, you know, raising nine kids on her own was really took a, a toll on her personal plans because my father was an expat. He was an absentee father for 15 years. He worked in Indonesia. Um, but I was a dedicated parishioner way back in Toril, uh, Santo Rosario, and an altar boy for four years. I, to my recollection, I haven't missed a single day of going to church the morning mass every day, except on a few occasions that I got really sick, even if it was like raining, you know, raining cats and dogs, as they say. But anyway, uh, I even contemplated on going to the seminary. So I was doing a weekend visit, but later on, I didn't have the calling. So it didn't work. During the college years in Davao City and many years after that, I was distanced from the Catholic Church. 
the reality of raising a family at a young age and of taking care and providing for the needs of the children really made me focus on the things that are economic in nature. I was, a, I was not very good at balancing, uh, you know, the uh, uh, honoring our faith and honoring our, the days of obligation where our faith is concerned. I was just focused on trying to find ways and means, including weekends. So I spent, I was a workaholic even at that time. So for almost 30 years, I was not a regular church participant, not even on a monthly basis, which I would have loved to maintain. Um, my attendance and, and participation in the Catholic Church was at best only on holidays and during events of a friend's life, like there's baptism, there's a wedding, there's funeral, and, and that's all. Uh, uh, I, up to this day, I could not really pinpoint, I haven't really done the process yet of what it was that really made me like stay away at that particular time. But there was no, there was no um, hatred there. There was no bitterness in particular. No, it was just, maybe I was just, wasn't able to, to balance things um, properly. Yeah. Then things started to change when I became a member of BCBP here, like uh, four years ago, or yeah, four years ago, here in New York. I got actively involved with St. Sebastian Church here in the middle of Woodside. And um, especially when I became very close to the uh, clergy that I mentioned earlier, I made a hint of that. Uh, he's from Kalinan, Davao City. So when I got very close to him, so we started to plan things and improving the, well, quote unquote, the ministry organizations. So I was assisting him in, in doing that. And so I came back to the fold of the church. And right now I, I am still very far from really what you may call like a, a devout uh, practicing Catholic but I am trying my best. During the interview, I would say that you are workaholic. You have a positive mental attitude. You are strong. You are aggressive. Question is, who inspires you? Okay, it is not a single person. Even, even way back during my high school days, well, towards the latter part of my high school, senior high or junior senior high, it's not really a single person that positively influenced me. Oddly enough, although I'm a devout Catholic before, I look upon the Buddhist monks. So mostly the ardent followers of the Dalai Lama. What I really admired with their personality is that it, because of their enduring belief in peace, in unity and harmony, I always okay. admire that. Yeah. yeah, me too. I admire Buddhist people. So what do you have in your bucket list that you want to fulfill within five years? Okay, here goes the, the wish list. And I hope it doesn't really remain just a wish. I want to grow my business to the point where it can provide me with specific, okay? The specific $30,000 a month, gross monthly income, so I can retire comfortably in the Philippines or just enjoy traveling all over. My current relationship, because I have two failed marriages, my, my fiance, uh, Jen, Jenaline Duran, is in an all out support mode with this plan. Incidentally, she's only 37, so, she has a lot of leeway when it comes to life planning. So whenever my my plan would would be would be a failure, she can always switch her plans. You know, I mean, by the time. So that's why she's very supportive. That, that's good to know. So can you share with our viewers, with our friends, with our family members, any inspirational thoughts about your experience in life? Oh yes, sure. <clears throat> um, 
I have always treasured these sayings, and one of them goes back to to my high school days. And these are these seem to become my main philosophical beliefs in business, in relationship, and in life in general. As a matter of fact, during the times when I was with Nissan as a senior executive, I incorporated this in the training programs that I conducted. So number one is really like helping someone is give a man a fish, he eats for a day. Teach him how to fish, he eats for a lifetime. That's from an old Chinese proverb. The second one is related to management and this goes, he who knows how will always get the job. But he who knows why will always be the boss. And finally, a short poem from my high school days. If you don't want to be forgotten as soon as you are dead and rotten, either do things worth writing or write things worth doing. Thank you very much. Florante Arconcel. I've learned so many things while doing this interview with you. And again, thank you for giving this opportunity to Global Inspiration. This is Jeanette Jordi at Global Inspiration, where you need to be seen, need to be heard, and be an inspiration to the world.